everybody. We are back with another segment of Disclosure, in this case, Disclosure Part 4. Now, for those of you who have been watching this series up until now, you'd know that we covered a lot of really dark stuff in regards to the current reality and past reality that we've been going through for quite some time now. Disclosure 4 is going to be a little bit different. As spoken about in Disclosure 3, the emphasis moving forward is at least for this segment, going to be very spiritually oriented, meaning we've spoken about the tunnels, we've spoken about extraterrestrial life, we've spoken about high technology, we've spoken about the children, and a lot of, once again, the dark realities going on. The question is, how do we shift into this higher state of consciousness to really make a change that we want to see in the world? TLS calls it the age of love. Many of you call it the second coming of Jesus. Other people call it the days of the Messiah. Other people call it Nirvana. Everybody has their own terminology to explain the same collective destiny that is inevitable for us to reach. The question is, how do we get there? And the simple answer is through awareness. So the intention of today's disclosure segment, part four, is about accessing higher consciousness, understanding things like reincarnation, supernatural abilities, understanding that they're not that supernatural, and one day what we call supernatural will simply be natural once again. Understanding religion, spirituality, what the real difference is, and of course, God, what that's really all about, how God plays a role in all of these conversations. So with that being said, Ray, thank you for being here once again and giving us your time. I look forward to the topics that we're going to be speaking about today and just going deeper into the, the things that need to be spoken about to bring us to this next level in our, call it, collective destiny. Good morning, and it's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. So before we start, I want to explain to the audience and define a, a term that you're going to be speaking about having to do with reincarnation, which is going to be the first topic that we speak about today. So let me just define that so you can use the word that you want to use so everybody can understand what it is that you're talking about. There's going to be a word that Ray uses in Hebrew called tikkun. Tikkun, the translation, if you want to go literally speaking, is something like a, a rectification. And generally the word tikkun is used in association with reincarnation, why you come back here. And it's this idea of the soul comes back and reincarnates, chooses specific circumstances and conditions to experience throughout its life in a physical body. And generally those conditions are difficult. They're obstacles, they're hardships. It could be living a life of poverty. It could be a relationship with your husband or your wife. It could be situations like your sexual orientation homosexuality, for example. Now, the reason why I'm bringing that up is because a lot of people, especially in the religious world, have been taught that a tikkun means that there is something broken with you. And that is not true. It's actually the exact opposite. Your tikkun, your rectification, is your single greatest opportunity. It's your soul chose a certain experience to go through so you actually have the ability to ascend, to reincarnate again in what would be your next step on your process of spiritual evolution. I say that because you may hear the word tikkun in Hebrew, a rectification in a negative light from others who are speaking about it. It is not, and it never has been. It's a positive thing, and if we choose to see it as that, we can use it as our greatest opportunity by understanding that these hardships are actually coming to teach us something, to help us grow and to help us expand. So with that being said, and I hope that that was a, an appropriate example or uh, explanation, you can add to that in whatever way you want. First of all, just to clarify, I know I've said it before. I'm not a guru. I'm not a rabbi. I'm not a priest. I happen to be a human being who thinks of himself as a spiritual being. Anything that I would tell you today is basically my opinion, and my opinion only. And I can share some past experiences that I had the pleasure to enjoy and experience. We're going to be starting with reincarnation, as we spoke about. And the reason why I want to start with the topic of reincarnation is because I think over the past two and a half years, 
a lot of people, it's been kind of reflected that a lot of people fear death. They fear something that may not actually exist to a point where many people are wearing masks in their car by themselves. It's completely irrational, and if anything, it increases their risk of death. But reincarnation, when we truly understand it from your perspective that you're, you're going to explain this interview, I think it may shed light and help people lose that fear completely, even those who think they don't fear death whatsoever, through sharing your experiences of what may exist on that other side, not even another world, call it another realm, another dimension, whatever you want to call it. So my first question for you, Ray, is can you explain the basis of reincarnation? Why do we reincarnate in the first place? What is it all about? How do we know it's real? First of all, reincarnation is very real. I think it's even scientifically proven, but we'll get to that later on in the discussion. Reincarnation is basically the recycling of a soul, or the cycling of a soul. That means a soul comes to planet Earth, takes on a body or a form, spends 50, 60, 200 years, whatever it is, and makes a decision at a certain point to leave, because they finish their destiny, their path in life, their tycoon, and they decide to move on. It's their decision to come down. It's their decision to leave. It's the soul's decision what path to take in life. The only thing parents have over a newborn child is his name. The name is extremely powerful and very important when you choose a name for a baby, because the name of a human being, of an entity, can change the destiny of the newborn, even though the soul decided to go on a specific path. So it can affect your destiny. It's going to affect your path in life. Other than the name, parents have no control of their children. They think they do. They have zero control. The soul decides which way to go, and the soul decides what life experience they are going to have for their own reasons and past experiences and past lives. So again, reincarnation is the recycling of the soul. You go, and you come back. Now you could come back over here, or you could come back to a different planet. Most of us here on Earth, we reside between the first and the third dimension. Can you explain the different dimensions before going into that? Dimensions are levels of spirituality that we bring with us on Earth, and our mission is to evolve and elevate ourselves to a higher dimension. The highest dimension is the tenth dimension, which, that's where the Source resides, God resides, call it whatever you like. And unfortunately, most humans reside in the second dimension. Now every dimension, by the way, is divided to ten sections. So you have ten in the first, second, third, and so on. That means a total of a hundred steps to reach the elite of the elite, which is the tenth dimension. Then once you get to the tenth dimension, that all of us strive to reach, the Source has the ability to reach endless dimensions that we don't even know what to call them. Not even a number for it, according to my teachings. Once a soul here on planet Earth reaches the fifth dimension, the tenth level of the fifth dimension, which means the highest level of the fifth dimension. For example, we heard about gamma and theta, and, okay, so this is the same thing, but it's a spirit within the spirit, and it's a different way to measure someone's spirituality and abilities. Wait, let me finish. Once a soul can pass the fifth dimension and reach the sixth, the seventh, or higher, it will reincarnate again. But this time it will not come to planet Earth or any other planet. It reaches a different realm in the universe. It's a spiritual form of life. If you can understand what I'm trying to say, I know it's complicated. Not physical. It's not physical at all. It's spiritual only. And basically that means you're on your way to the top, which is the 10th dimension. I have a very difficult question to ask you when it comes to reincarnation. But before I get to that, I still want to set a certain foundation, some questions having to do with souls and new souls. So number one, is there such thing as a new soul? Yes. 
how does a new soul form? And the reason why I ask that is there's a law, a scientific law. It says energy cannot be created or destroyed. In that way, reincarnation actually makes sense because, like you said, it's the recycling of souls, the recycling of energy. What is just beyond my comprehension at the moment is when we speak about a new soul, what is a new soul? And what's the purpose of a new soul? A new soul means a soul that came to planet Earth that wasn't here before. The purpose is basically, and I'll give you examples soon, about people that you know. A new soul is here to come and do a higher type of mission. They have a certain destiny that they have to complete. It's usually in the spirit or religious world. Unfortunately, in the religious world, because you know me, I'm against religion in general, but most of them are. And I'll give you an example. Take the Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama, and there's many of them as you know. If you ask the followers of the Dalai Lama, they'll tell you he is the reincarnation of the previous Dalai Lama, and so on and so on. But no, that's not true. Every Dalai Lama that was here was a new soul. He will complete. The current Dalai Lama will complete his mission. He will then recycle, reincarnate, and he will reincarnate to the higher realm. That means above the fifth dimension and he will never come back here again. The new Dalai Lama will do the same thing. That's when it comes to the Dalai Lama. Another example of a new soul, the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He was here in Brooklyn, New York, passed away about 20-something years ago. He was a new soul. He came here, did 90 years, did huge, big work in the Jewish community and the entire world, became very famous, very well known finished his work, moved on, he is not coming back. By the way, never had any children. 50% of his followers, unfortunately, call him the Messiah, which is total nonsense. He never called himself the Messiah. He never said the word Messiah. That's absolutely not true, but that's where people go with it. This is where the fanatics are coming in, in every religion. You have those fanatics. So you can reincarnate, not necessarily back here, but to a higher realm. Yes. Before I ask a question about that, when and why would a soul stop reincarnating? I don't think they ever will. I think, again, a new soul here will stop reincarnating here. But in the big picture of the universe, I don't think ever stop reincarnating because your desire what you strive for is to reach the 10th dimension at the highest level possible. And from there, there are other things that we are not even aware of yet. One day when I meet God, I'll tell you. <laughs> but right now, I don't have an answer. But again, everybody is striving to get to the 10th dimension. So the Dalai Lama, let's go back to him. He will reincarnate going to the 6th, 7th, 8th dimension eventually striving to reach the 10th dimension. But again, like you said, energy, God, the source was always here. Always will be here. Will always be part of everybody and everyone. And there's no such a thing as the end of the world. It's a huge space, endless space that you cannot put a number on. Not on the number of the stars, the planets, the, it's like endless, so yeah. Are planets being destroyed? Yes. Do they self-destruct eventually for some reasons? Yes. But there's always a cycle of life going on. Spiritual life and physical life. When it comes to reincarnation, I want to ask you a difficult question. You've spoken a lot about underground tunnels, certain things that are going on, terrible things that are going on down there having to do with children. You're stating that the soul chooses, with the exception of its name, the soul chooses its uh, experiences and circumstances in its life when it reincarnates. If that's the case, why would a soul ever choose to come back as one of those children in the tunnels? I'll give you an example. Let's assume somebody is born handicapped. Why would the soul choose to be handicapped? 
It's only a life of suffering. Why would a soul choose to come autistic into this life? It's all about what we spoke. The tukun, for example. Let's assume I have a son, and he was born autistic. It's possible that the soul came back in order to give me my tukun for me to take care of him. Because I could be, in my previous life, I was a cruel human being who was killing autistic children or mentally challenged kids, you understand? And if you look in history, there is a lot of people who, and I'm not going to mention names, but in their eyes, mentally challenged children should be put to death. So maybe I was one of those people. This soul came back to fulfill my tacoon, and not necessarily his tacoon. It could be that you are born into major poverty, always starving, no food on the table. Why would you choose that? Could be that that soul was a multi-billionaire in a different life. And never helped anybody. Never took care of anybody. Never did anything for other human beings. Totally selfish. Came back in order to experience poverty. In order to fix it through that. And probably after this reincarnation, will come back again as a multi-millionaire maybe. Or some type of powerful politician that can help those poor souls. The bottom line is to correct what you didn't have a chance to correct in the previous life. For you to get to the fifth dimension, or above, you must get to a completion of correction. If you're not going to do this, you're never going to reach the fifth dimension. Even though that's somebody like the rabbi that we know, he can help you reach the fifth in this reincarnation for you to experience certain things. It was done to me, by the way. But it doesn't mean that I'm going to go above the fifth dimension in the next life and reach other places because if I still do follow the rules, and I still don't do exactly what I'm supposed to do, because it's very hard to be this righteous person, extremely hard. And if I don't do it, I'll keep coming and reincarnating. Me, myself, and I, I think, I think I wrote it in the Pyramid Code. This is my 69th reincarnation. That means I never completed what I'm supposed to do. That's why I keep coming back. Hopefully this time will be the last time so I can move on, but we don't know. Well, I can tell you that if you want it to be the last time, there are certain things that you're going to have to do that you know what you have to do that you're not doing. Yeah, because I have my way of thinking, my philosophies in life, and I do not always agree with the higher beings. I want to ask you when it comes to, for the viewers watching right now, a big question that I would have as a viewer And as myself, which I've asked you is, how can we, what can we do right now to fulfill those tikkunim, those rectifications, those corrections in this lifetime to help us get there as quick as possible? You need to do the best that you can do to improve your life and others at the same time. You need to help others whenever you can mentally, physically, financially. When you see the suffering that's being done by others, You need to find a way to stop them. You need to talk. Most people, they see a person being mugged on the street. They're going to look away and take off. They're not even going to stop to call the police. That's what I mean. So you got to do whatever you can on a daily basis. You wake up in the morning and you got to say to yourself, what good am I going to do today for others, not for myself? Mm. That's how you improve yourself. It's very hard, extremely hard. Because some mornings you wake up and you're pissed off at everybody. And you're in the mood to kill somebody because some things didn't go your way the previous day or whatever. So it's extremely hard. But that's what we have to aim for, all of us. When it comes to reincarnation, there's this idea of soul family, soul groups. Do we generally reincarnate in soul groups? And if so, are we related to those people through blood? Generally, yes. In some cases, like mine, no, I'm not. But I'm not. That's not normal. When you say you're not, what do you mean? In my current reincarnation, I have no connection to my blood family. Meaning your soul family is not your blood family? My soul family today is not blood-related from previous reincarnations. Usually, let's say you married somebody. You can come back as you are the husband, and she is the wife. You could come back as the daughter, and she would be the father. But there's always this combination, 
and there is a closeness that stays with you throughout life. How do animals play a role in this? Same thing. You understand that most religious leaders, if any of them are going to listen to this interview, will tell you that I'm insane, and that we both have to be arrested. But yes, like the Jewish religion, for example, they refuse to accept the fact that a human being can reincarnate into an animal, and vice versa. Why do you think that is? Ego. That's what I think. It's just pure ego. Do you know any animals in your current life that were a part of your past life? Yes. Are they still animals or are they people? Both. Interesting. You spoke about 69 reincarnations as being your 69th. Yes. How many of those 69 do you remember? 23. How do they come to you? What do you mean? How do you go about remembering them? Oh, that's a long story. Complicated. Let me ask the question a little differently for anybody that doesn't have a background here. You're the author of the Pyramid Code. Yes. You're the one who wrote it, obviously, anybody that read the Pyramid Code. I mean, it's a very in-depth remembrance of something that is, I mean, thousands of years ago from ancient Egypt and other times as well that's documented over there. So with that being your, your foundation, your history, for anybody who has read that and for anybody who hasn't, I encourage you all to read that because you'll understand a little bit more about why I'm asking this question. Such a deep remembrance, there must be some form of technique. A lot of people ask me to ask you, how do we go about remembering them? Because if we can remember reincarnations to the level that you do and many others do, and it's not that common right now, I think one day it will be. But if we can remember that, history is no longer forgotten. They can't lie in our textbooks anymore. Atlantis will no longer be a myth or a legend. A lot of things change because suddenly we remember through our knowingness and our memory, of course this is possible. So that's why I'm asking you this question. How do you go about remembering? Are there any techniques that you can share? First of all, out of the 69, I remember only 23. How do I know I'm 69? Because I was told. I don't remember 69. I was various entities, and I just remember 23. Reincarnation could be a baby that's born and dies at one year old. Reincarnation could be that we live for 900 years. You understand? Reincarnation is the fact that we were here even for one day, and you left Earth for some reason. That's reincarnation. How do I remember this? Okay. First of all, there are techniques and teachings that you could do to certain people, not everyone, that you can bring them to an elevated dimension, and through that you can train them and show them the way to go back into a past life. You can travel in time to see things that are connected to you or not connected to you. But whatever is connected to you, your memory, will start coming back to you. However, in my case, that's not what happened. In my case, in 2012, I was in a mission with a group of people, including the rabbi, and something happened that day. There was a huge explosion. It wasn't a mission here on planet Earth. It was a mission with my body. But not. Not on Earth. Something happened and there was a huge explosion. Something happened to me that moment that I cannot explain. The rabbi told me he doesn't know. He doesn't know how to explain it either. I was sure that he did something to me. But he has always maintained that he had nothing to do with this. But it was a huge explosion. Nobody could explain what happened that day. And as soon as it happened, when we landed back here, I started seeing things that in the beginning I thought, I'm going crazy. I thought I'm losing it. And it took me a long time to understand that I'm not crazy. And what I see is true. For example, I would come, I would come home, and I can look at my wife and suddenly I see a different person. And I see a whole life story. And it's going crazy. 
I could see somebody that I really love, a good friend of mine that I know for years, and I see this evil person in front of me, and I really want, I forget who I am, and I go back to this past life, and I really want to hurt him, because I feel that he's a threat. I feel that he is evil, and very good people I've been friends with for many years. I couldn't say anything to anybody. The only person I could talk to was the rabbi, and it took me a long time to. But I will start seeing things through people's eyes. If I see you, provided you don't have contacts or glasses, and if I know you from before, I will recognize you in most cases. Is it a memory that comes to you, or is it something you see in the eyes? How does it come to you? There is a certain energy in the eyes that gives me the vision of what happened then. And I can get, I can go to very specific details, dates, weddings, deaths, funerals. I can give you a lot, a lot of things, bad things, individual things that the person did, things I've done that I'm not very proud of. It takes you back. And with this time I started, I started remembering through those people I started remembering specific reincarnations. Why I don't remember all of them? I don't know. But I know that, I know I can give you a life story of 23. Some of them I wrote down so I'll have it, because I'm afraid to forget. Some of them I'm not allowed to write down, so I was not given permission to write it down physically. For example, the reincarnation of the year 2448, according to the Hebrew calendar, which is written about in the Pyramid Code. For me, it was a very important period that to me was like, first of all, it was my first reincarnation ever. So to me, it was the most important, personally. And I want to write it, and I never got permission until the rabbi came in and gave me permission to write it. And that's when I went and wrote it. And that's the first time I ever spoke about it. Are you referring to what happened in that meeting? Yeah, but after that, I sat down and I wrote the story of the year 2448. So you're referring to the Hebrew calendar? Yes. For anybody that doesn't understand what he's talking about, there's a difference in dates between the Hebrew calendar and the Gregorian calendar. So the date is around 1300 BC. I don't remember off the top of my head, but that's what you're talking about. Yes. And that's the pyramid code? Yes what it is that you were asked to document. I was given permission to document in order to give it to you for you to continue from there. And I wasn't, I wasn't in favor of publishing it, as you know. I was against it. But in a way, I was forced to. I wanted to write it down. And I wanted to tell the story to my close, like to my people who I'm close to. Not to the world. You weren't forced. Was forced. You weren't forced. Because it's either I do this, or I don't write it at all. This was the... So you weren't forced, you were just given a difficult decision. I was forced. I wanted to write it without publishing it. This means you're being forced. They said if you're not going to publish it, you're not going to write it. That's not being forced. That's being forced. That's putting a gun to your head in my book. So I did it. How were you able to know the difference between... A past life memory that's real and something that's just your imagination. Again, I'm asking these questions so people can understand for themselves. I bring this all back to whoever is watching. I want them to gain value from this. So my intention of asking you this, and I know your intention of sharing it, is not just to tell people the story. It's so they can understand what they can do. So keep that in mind when you answer the question. How, what is the difference? How do you know the difference? between what is real as a memory and what is just your hallucinating or imagining. I was asking the same question in the beginning also. It was a very difficult period in my life. I really thought I'm losing it. How do you know? You know because the memory comes to you every time that I was looking into people's eyes. And if I look to a specific person, it's always the same story coming back, not a different story. In one case, it was this friend of mine who, who always complained about stomach pains on the right side of her stomach. She's like, always complaining. 
most of her life. She's a mother, mother of two, complaining about pain. Close friend. And I sat down, and I told her how she died last time. It was something to do with the Holocaust, but we're not going to get into the details. And she was stabbed. You know those rifles from World War II, with the knife on them? She was... that's how she was killed. She was a man at that time. As soon as I told her, the pain was gone. Never came back again. How do you explain that? That's showing you that I'm not imagining things. Because even though she could not remember the story, she could relate to it. I have a memory. She doesn't. But I was able to bring her to her childhood memories that she forgot that affected her life as well. So it's a very, very difficult life to live. Especially in the beginning. Today I'm more used to it. I know if I see something and I don't want to experience it because sometimes it's painful, I'll look the other way. I take my eyes down or I walk away from the scene. Some people, they wear sunglasses or glasses and for some reason, I'm curious to see their eyes. I would make up an excuse for them to take their glasses off so I can take a look. I would do that and... The same goes with animals, correct? Meaning the eyes. Yes. Hmm. So therefore, for example, if I would meet a blind person, I would never be able to tell. It happened to me once that I was able to because he had a very... It was a woman. She was completely blind, but there was a line within the eye that was still exposed. And she did not have any glasses on. She was walking with a cane, and I was able to see and recognize her. So you're now speaking about something that we spoke about, that you speak about in Hebrew. The translation is the line of light, correct? Correct. Is there one or multiple? Everybody has a different line. When we say you reach the line of light, that means you are elevated to a different level of spirituality. This has nothing to do with me recognizing you. So I could look into your eyes. Even a stranger. A complete stranger. I have no relation with past, future, whatever. No relationship. And I can pick up on the level of spirituality according to the level of the light. The line of light, as you call it. By the way, when it comes to reincarnations, only because we've had this conversation before, in the last interview you were speaking about this event in Jerusalem, uncovering certain things from under the Dome of the Rock, under the Western Wall specifically, and you mentioned 150 feet below. How is it that you knew that? I was the person who put it there. This is, by the way, the 2,448 year reincarnation I've spoken to you about. It was right before the destruction of the Second Temple. We knew there was trouble coming in. So we took all this equipment, items, and we took it down below the Dome of the Rock. Today it's a mosque. At that time, it was the temple. The holy temple. And it was put in for future generations. So it's still there. Nobody got to it yet, so I know exactly where it is. As a matter of fact, there's an entrance that you could go through, right by the western wall, that nobody knows about. Except a few people who are there and know what's going on. But nobody is going in, in order to retrieve the items. But there's a way of getting down there. You don't even have to dig that much. You don't have to dig 150 feet. The path is there. There's even stairs to go down. But you need to know. There's one wall that you're going to have to carve into in order to get it out. But everything else was done already. Who's in possession of that path right now? In real life, nobody. But there is a yeshiva. A yeshiva is a Jewish school, right by the western wall that is a few feet underneath the western wall. Most people don't even know that it exists. And from there, there's access to the path that I'm talking about. You're talking about roughly 200 students. 
This is the yeshiva that's controlled by the rabbi, Rabbi Aleph Aleph. It's being controlled by him, by his students. And they know it exists. So what you're telling me is that Rabbi AA has a school under the Western Wall, which also has to do in direct connection with the path or the area that will take you to that wall that you would have to break to uncover in order to retrieve the objects like the Ark of the Covenant and the staffs from Egypt and things like that, to at some point uncover that to the world. Yes, the entrance door is right by the western wall. It's a regular door that you just... I can take you and show you the door even, but you won't be able to get in. But when you look on it, it's going to look like a regular door, but nobody bothers to go in there. Nobody can get in there if you're going to try. They're going to stop you in a second. So it's being guarded without any guards. So you're basically... I was physically there. So I know how to get in. And I know how to move from there. Besides, I know the location of the items. What kinds of things do they teach in this school? And how do you get there? How do you get where? How do you get to be a part of that school? You're being chosen by... I guess, the rabbi and his people. You know, it's not a school that you register and you pay tuition to go in. You're being chosen. Is everybody in the school a part of TLS? None of them are a part of TLS. There are 200 young men who are studying the Bible, basically. The Zohar, and everything related to the studies. For them, Judaism is the path. But all of them have supernatural abilities such as out-of-body experiences. I saw them do that. They do it through prayers, though. They don't do it like me. They do it through prayers. That's very interesting. And none of them are a part of TLS? None of them are part of TLS, no. Do they know about TLS? Yes. So they know who the rabbi really is? Yes. Look, it's not that I had a conversation with them. I was there. I had a conversation with the rabbi. I was introduced to the school, basically, and I was given a tour. But when they leave, they go through the door, they close the door, and then they go home. And is it all undercover? Of course. So wherever they're going home, their family doesn't know where they're learning? The family? I don't know what the family knows. I'm assuming that they don't know. But there's no sign on the door with the name. No, there's no such a thing. What is the name? I don't think I'm at liberty to say the name right now. I have to check, and I can tell you later, and you can tell your viewers later on if you'd like. Fair enough. Let's move on. Before we go to the next, call it segment or topic within this interview having to do with supernatural abilities and higher powers and all that, I want to ask you a couple more questions regarding reincarnation and how souls work. Number one, is it possible for the same soul to be in multiple bodies at the same time? Yes. What does that look like exactly? What does that mean? Why would that happen? It's a split soul. Meaning you could be Jason sitting here, and there could be another Muhammad sitting in Saudi Arabia that is part of your soul. It just happens to be a different entity, and you guys don't know about each other, but the soul knows. It could be also more than two. It doesn't have to be two. It could be more than two. How many have you seen simultaneous? Me? Myself? I think four. But you know when you have those people that they put them in the loony bin because they talk. Like five minutes they are a man, then a woman. And there was this woman that had 75 personalities within her. They're not exactly crazy. It was just 75 souls within one body. So that's the opposite. So on one hand there could be one soul in multiple bodies. On the other hand there could be multiple souls in one body. Yes. Is that a negative thing? In the spirit world, there is no such a thing as a negative or evil. It doesn't exist. It's something that we made up as humans so we can understand and distinguish between certain entities. Are you able to have multiple souls in one physical body or experiencing cohabitating, if you want to call it, in one physical body without, call it like schizophrenia or multiple personality disorder? It's being perceived as schizophrenia because we don't understand what's going on. And since we don't understand what's going on, 
We usually take those people when they are young, people usually, and we start giving them drugs. And then you really screw up with their mind and soul, and then they become, in our minds, evil or bad people. But there's a reason for everything that happens. Nothing happens by coincidence. There's a reason why there's 75 souls in one body. Very unusual, I agree, but there's a reason. Again, the source makes everything. And if he decided for this to happen, there's a reason. We don't know the reason, but there's a reason behind it. For anybody watching who may have a schizophrenic in their family, or what they call schizophrenia, what would your recommendation or advice be on how to deal with something like that, knowing what you know? Look, I don't know. I'm not a professional in the field. I don't think it's my place to give a recommendation. The only thing I can say, if it's a small child, before you start giving him drugs and going to conventional doctors and drugging him up, use love and try to understand. I know it's hard, but you need, you need as a mother to commit to this child. Maybe this child is your cocoon. He came here with multiple souls within him for you to do the right thing. Most mothers, most fathers, they don't. They see it as a burden. They see it as a problem. They'd rather drug the kid up. It could be something as simple as ADD. They go to Ritalin, and that's it. Let's quiet him up because the teacher is not happy in school. My advice would be, you are the best doctor. The soul of this child is the best doctor. Work with the entity in front of you. Don't drug him up. Love is the key. And he's there for a reason. And you have to commit to him. And this is probably your life tycoon, as we call it. But people, again, they don't realize it. They don't want to realize it. It's very hard to comprehend. And it's a difficult life to live. So you could see a lot of parents. They just give the kid up. Institution or something like that. Understood. I want to shift over to the next topic over here, supernatural abilities, higher powers, explaining how that works specifically through certain experiences that you've had and with TLS as an organization. So I understand that things like levitation, shape-shifting, telepathic communication, telekinetic movement, all these things that many people call supernatural are used in many cases to execute certain operations on the side of TLS for many conversations that we've had and a lot of things that you've shared in this disclosure series as well. My first question for you is, when TLS chooses certain individuals to be a part of the organization, are they individuals who already have these abilities and have accessed these abilities, or do they bring them in and teach them? In most cases, they bring them in and they teach them. It's a learning process. A teaching process in most cases. So if the individual hasn't already accessed the ability to do certain things, why would they choose one over the other? Their energy, their frequency, their dimension. It's a combination of things. When they actually bring that individual in, whether it's you, if you want to speak on that experience, or just vaguely big picture, what kinds of things would TLS do to teach an individual and help them access? There is a teacher that spends time with you and teaches you. If it's an out-of-body experience, they do it over and over and over again and give you the technique of how to do it until you get it right. It doesn't happen in one day. It's a process. So there's a faster process and there's a shorter process. Let's assume you have to teach somebody certain information for him to have in his brain. You could download information to someone's brain, without a computer, of course. And you could. Information that would take me years to comprehend could be done in 24 to 48 hours. Through a download. Through a download. They call it a download. Then once the mission is over and this download is no longer necessary for you to have, it could be unloaded. That's interesting. So if you did something wrong, and they decided this information is not in the right hands, they could unload it. Are 
drugs or any plant medicine ever used in regards to TLS and developing certain abilities? No, only for protection. For example, if you have to travel through space, this is a big task on your body. The body cannot handle it normally. So they might have to give you certain herbs to drink in order for you not to get hurt during the travel. Are they herbs that give you an effect that, let's say, psilocybin or ayahuasca would give you? No, they taste really bad. And in most cases, they might get you tired for the first time. But no, no, not something. No, not things like that. Have you ever seen TLS advocate for anything like psilocybin, mushrooms, which is psilocybin, ayahuasca, or anything of that nature? Not to my knowledge, no. Hmm. Drugs in general are prohibited. Well, you can call them drugs, you can call them plant medicine. A lot of the viewers would call them plant medicine. Obviously, if someone is sick and certain plants will be proper for this person, yeah, they'll give it whenever it's necessary. But what's in them? I don't know. I know I was given concoctions and I was drinking them. Sometimes I drink it for a month at a time. Two months at a time. It makes you nauseous. The first I was like really sick. I was very nauseous all the time. You mentioned that TLS would strip one of their ability that they helped them access in the first place in certain situations. Why? In what situation would that ever happen? Either you're retired and you're no longer with the organization. Either you took certain abilities and you did certain things without permission. So they would downgrade you basically. That's what it's called. Has it ever happened to you? Yes. Can you elaborate? No. Please? What do you want to know? I, I screwed up, I was punished. It's very simple. Okay, but share, it's interesting. I can't, I can't share. You could, you don't want to. I can't share this on video, no. <laughs> Is that not even one? I give you a few things in private. I'm not going to do it on video. About certain abilities that were stripped away. Yeah, you want to know why? I'm not going to tell you why in video. Not going to happen. You did something you shouldn't have done. Yes. Okay, fair enough. So in that, that situation, that's when they take it away. Yes. How do they do it? Is it... Like the erasing of memory? How, does it, how do they go about it? Something like that, yes. Can you explain further? Usually it's done without machines. It's done with the hands of somebody superior, like the rabbi. He has the ability to download or unload information. Speaking about the rabbi, I know that there are some very old individuals that are a part of TLS, physically old, hundreds of years old. Call them like the elders. How is it that they live so long? 400, 500, 600 years. Can you speak more about that lifestyle? They eat very little. They are vegans. They don't touch any chemicals. All the food is organic. Otherwise, they don't touch it. They fast a lot. They are spiritually elevated. They're always happy. They make sure they're happy. That's part of their mission, to stay happy. Anger is the worst thing for your body. Rarely will you see them getting upset. They always stay cool and calm and... and very highly evolved spiritual beings. So yeah, they can live for a very long time, if not forever. Being that you've had so many experiences with somebody like the rabbi, for example, and I've seen this firsthand for a prolonged period of time with how he eats, how he lives, the way that he carries himself. You're not a vegan. I'm not going to say you're calm because you're not. You're the exact opposite of that lifestyle on the day to day. Why? Because it's very hard. I tried. I was for a period of time on and off, but at the end of the day, I failed. That's the honest answer. And the main point, if you want the real answer, is. I don't care to reincarnate, because what I know today, death doesn't scare me. I'm scared from old age. I'm scared of being sick, scared of getting hurt. I have no fear with death.
For me, death doesn't exist. That's the way I believe. That's the way I think life works. You just move on. And in my position, at my age, I have no issue with moving on because I know those people. I know them very well. They seem very happy. I'm not saying they're not happy, but I can tell you they're very lonely. Extremely lonely. They're students. They're soldiers. The organization are their children. Are their people. But it's not. A family life. It's different. Although he sees them as family. But to me it's a very lonely life. Um. Like sexual interaction. It's almost non-existent. Every one of them was married. Every one of them had children. But they passed away. They moved on. Those people are not going to go get married again and have. It's not in their way of life. They don't think about it. Their level of spirituality is so high. Sex is not an issue even. For me, I'm still a human being with needs. So I don't think I want to be living 600 years like that. All of them were normal people who were introduced to the organization. And slowly, slowly they were trained and moved on in life. And they got to the level where they are because they chose to. They like it. That's what they want to do. For example, the rabbi is over 400 years old now. He was recruited at the age of 50, you understand? Going back 400 years with his experiences since then, it's unbelievable. The abilities he has you cannot comprehend. Amazing guy. Amazing knowledge. Amazing supernatural powers. He was married. He has children. They all died. Did there come a point where he had to fake his death? I don't know. I assume so, but he, he travels all over the world, and he doesn't have a passport. How he does it, I don't know. I've been with him on a plane, and I even asked him once, why are you even on a plane? You could do it, you know. You could just remove yourself, and he said, that's not how it works. When you have to travel, you travel. I'm still a human being, but he doesn't have papers. How does he get to places? I'm sure he has a backup with his people. He has something. But when he landed, we landed both in JFK. I went like a normal human being and went through the process. And he was taken out from the side. There was a door, you know, where they bring luggage through. There were stairs there. A vehicle was waiting and took him. So how do they do it? I don't know. But look, private planes, helicopters. They have everything you want at their disposal if they need to move things. So this is not an issue. And keep in mind, they do not take donations. I don't want people thinking they collect donations and they do all this lavish life and all that. No, that's not the case. Where does all that money come from? They're running businesses, real businesses. And they have big businesses around the world that... That's the cover. That's the cover. But money is coming in. They pay the taxes. People get salaries. Most people, I don't, but people get salaries. They have homes. They have families. Why haven't these, I call them elders, why haven't they come out to show themselves? The entire organization doesn't show itself. There must be somebody that old that's not a part of TLS? Oh, no, no, there's no such a thing. Everybody that is that old belongs to some organization. This is, that's the spirit life. I don't think anybody exists in a normal life that lives for past 100 to 120. Maybe 140. And no, when you see him, he looks like a good-looking 80, 85-year-old. He doesn't look that old. He looks good. He's very active. No cane. Full of hair. Not bald. No problems. Doesn't wear glasses. Do you believe everybody has the ability to reach that level and to live that long if they choose to? Yes. What would you say the main factor is? Lifestyle. Diet. Everything I mentioned, everything I mentioned in the spirit life, that's what revives the soul. Gotcha. The body is just the equipment. You could fix it. It's like a car breaks down. You could fix the car. But the soul is the main thing. When the body dies, it's really the soul decided to move on. Yeah, but I think it's possible for everybody. Yes.
I want to move on to a topic having to do with time. You and I have had a lot of conversations about time, time travel, what time really is and how it all works. So first and foremost, there's a paradox in science. They call it the grandfather paradox, which pretty much states that if I were to theoretically or hypothetically travel back in time to when my grandfather was a kid before I was born and kill him, what would happen to me? I bring that up right now because there's some really interesting stuff that you've shared that make a lot of sense regarding time, how it really works. And when we have the awareness of that, it clears a lot of things up. So can you speak on the idea of time, what it is, and if time travel is possible, can you go to the past? Can you go to the future? What does it mean and how? First of all, there's no such a thing as going back in time, traveling back in time and changing the past. This doesn't exist. This is made up nonsense. We view everything according to light. The reason you see me now is because there's light here. The video is not capturing me. It's capturing the light. If you want to travel in time and see the past, it's possible. Let's take an event in history. Let's take the inauguration of President Reagan, okay? It happened roughly 40 years ago. The event happened. It was captured on video. People were there. The entire world saw it. The event is over, but the energy, which is the light, moves on. Energy, which is the light. Light moves at the speed of light, which is 300,000 kilometers per second. So in 40 years, it's pretty far away. Imagine now that I have a train that travels double the speed. 600,000 kilometers per second. Maybe it will take me 20 years to reach it, because I have to catch up to it. But I have to travel at this speed for a long time. But eventually I will catch up to the energy, to this light. And I'll be able to see the event, because the event will always be there. The light will always be there. It never dissipates. It travels, but it's always there. Once you reach the light, you see the event. You can experience the event. You can be in the event. However, you're not going to hear anything. Why? Because the speed of sound is only one kilometer per almost three seconds. More or less, I'm giving you a number, okay? So therefore, when you catch up to the energy of the light, you will see the light. But you're not going to catch up because the energy of the sun is totally somewhere else because of the distance. You're going to experience in your eyes, not in your ears. So that means that you can technically see the past, which also is technically happening in the present, because you're traveling there and experiencing it in your present, which means that every single past, past experience or reality is still somewhere, including the exodus in Egypt, let's say it's happening. Technically, let's say that was about 3,000 years ago. So hypothetically, if I was able to travel fast enough and take a telescope and look at Earth, from 3,000 light years away, then I would see what was happening in ancient Egypt. Correct. But I wouldn't hear it because the sound is somewhere else. Correct. Obviously, there's no such a train that can go that fast. And according to the scientists, the fastest thing in the universe is the speed of light. But there's only one thing that can surpass the speed of light. It's the soul of a human being. You can travel at the speed of light. Okay? With your soul to experience the past. That means if you experience the past, there's no past. Past, present, and future are all in the same moment. That's why you hear people, spiritual people, talking about the moment. We are in the moment. Everything that happened will happen and already happened. And whatever will happen in the future already happened. It just recycles. Do you understand my point? Yes. So it's all about light. The light is the source. The light is God. The light is energy. That's what connects all of us as one. The question is, I understand the, the illusion of the past and how to access that in the present through what you're calling the speed of thought or the power of thought, which is faster than the speed of light. The only thing that's faster than the speed of light. The question is, is when it comes to this idea of the future, if you can access even the illusion of what we call the future, my problem with that is it takes away the freedom of choice because now you would be saying 
that it's predetermined. You cannot travel to the future. You can experience the past. What already happened, you cannot change it. The future could be changed at any given moment according to the soul or to the souls involved. If a soul decided to go left instead of right, it's the decision of the soul and you cannot change it. Only the soul can change it. So therefore, if you go into the future and you come back and say, oh, I saw the soul making a right, it cannot happen. There's no such a thing. You cannot see something that did not happen yet. You can see something that already happened. So that's where free will comes in, where we can make whatever choice we want and then experience everything accordingly. Exactly. No free will, there will be no life. The same way if there's no sun, there will be no life. Every planet has a sun. Some type of sun. Some type of light. Everything works on light. There will be no light. There will be no universe. No planet Earth. Nothing. God will not exist without the light. Because he is the light. Now you got it? Yes. Okay. Let me summarize real quick before going to the next topic. Big picture over here. And by the way, I encourage you guys to watch this portion over again because it's interesting. Past, present, and future exist in the same moment. To access the past, you can do so technically by traveling faster than the speed of light, but you can only observe it, you can't influence it, meaning the grandfather paradox is a falsehood to begin with because it's working on principles that we don't even understand, scientifically speaking. Once you observe it in the past, which is in your present, you can observe, you can't influence, and you also can't hear because the speed of sound travels differently than the speed of light, and therefore the sound is in a different place than the light is. We got the big picture? Yes, just one correction. Certain souls that have the ability, they can bring the speed of sound and the speed of light of an event where they can experience them both. But you're talking about very highly evolved spiritual beings. Physical beings? Physical beings. Human beings? Yes. Amazing. When it comes to these spiritual realms, you've, first of all, it's documented in Rays of Light, spoken about in the Pyramid Code. Speaking about these different dimensions, different worlds, different realms, where other spirit souls, entities are, whatever you want to call it. Can you speak about your experience? with these other realms. And I want to understand, and I want the viewers to understand how they work. By the way, I'm going to segue into asking you, what do they feel like there? We're going now into like what people call the afterlife. Before I'll answer that, we were talking about reincarnation, and I told you there's proof of reincarnation. So I think we have to establish this first and move on. Let's take, let's take your sister, okay? You know when she was born. You know her all her life. You know she can speak two languages. And now you put her under hypnosis. And you take her back in time. And suddenly, she speaks to you in ancient Chinese. You have no idea what she is saying. You have to bring a translator, a special translator, to see what the hell she's talking about. And she'll start telling you about her life in ancient China from a thousand years ago. It's not even Chinese of today, it's like ancient Chinese. And she's telling you her life story, where she was born, who her husband was, who her children were, how she was born, how she died and all that. And you know your sister cannot fake this because there is no way she speaks ancient Chinese. To me, it's a proof reincarnation exists. Now let's take it further. Imagine that you take, and it happens a lot of times in a few places around the world, where a child came up and started saying, let's say he saw something on TV and said, I know him. This is me. And he started telling the life story of this person on TV who died a long time ago, and he's only a small child. You know he cannot make this up, and you know the parents cannot teach him to say all the details. And when they go back to this far country that this kid was talking about, and he's giving details, and he's saying this was his wife, this was his daughter, you know, this cannot be fake. And there are many examples of children. Forget adults. Adults always make up stuff. They can be actors, and they're making stuff up. And you see that the details are matching up with the story. 
When you go and you find this dead person's, record and you see, yeah, he was a pilot. He was this, and the kid knew all the information about it. For me, it's proof. Most people will tell you I'm insane, but that's for me enough proof. I think you'll agree with me, but most people will not agree with us. So this is the reincarnation. Now go back to your question because I forgot your question. My question was, a lot of different realms are spoken about throughout Rays of Light specifically. Connecting with other realms, call it on the other side in a different dimension, whatever you want to call it. I want to understand, and I want to ask you if you could share your experiences with this other side. Some people call it connecting with the dead. Other people call it connecting just with a different dimension where, where a soul reincarnated differently and you have that connection. I, I bring this up right now because I think it's just, first of all, it's beautiful. And shedding light on that can do a lot of wonders to people in the world if they can accept that as a truth. Okay. So I can only talk about my personal experiences. I never connected or tried to communicate with a soul. Any interaction I had was they came up to me, and it just took me time to understand what the hell was going on because you think you're going nuts. So the interaction came from them, not from me. As far as I know, doing what you're saying, communicating with the dead, it's not even allowed. It's negative and can affect you in a negative way. So first of all, I don't know how to do it, and I don't do it. I cannot call it communicating with the dead because, as I told you before, death for me doesn't exist. But if you want to use this term for the sake of this discussion, we'll do that. I'd rather not use that term. I'd rather use what it really is of understanding that you're, you're just connecting to a soul somewhere else. Okay, so take a dream. Dreams are very good ways to communicate. A soul comes to you in your dream. A soul can talk to you through your dream. A soul can direct you in your dream. And I'm talking about a real dream, not something that you make up in your mind, not imagination. The question is, would you remember in the morning what was told? Would you take it as imagination or real dream, as I call it? Most people would dismiss it. The only reason I'm not dismissing it is because of how these things came to me, not only through my dreams. It started interfering with my daily life, which I had to pay attention to. Again, I was forced to pay attention to it. Information was given to me. When I checked the information, I saw it's correct. So I said, okay, you're not that crazy. Something is going on. I didn't in the beginning understand what the hell they wanted from me. But at the end, it's basically to recruit you. To use you for certain things. You become... They use you. It's a very simple word. And it's the honest word to say. They use you and it's okay. But they want to use you with permission. They will not do something against your will. But it takes time because a normal person, you're going to come out and say right away what you want to say. You're going to run away. And it took time. Many people are running away. I chose to stay. I don't know why, but I fought it in the beginning and eventually went with the flow. As I said, so what is it? And later on, I was on a higher level and a higher level. And I experienced an actual, I could say, discussions with certain entities. What is life there? I don't know if to call it life. It's a spiritual world. Obviously, there are no bodies. You could actually have a real full-blown discussion. In the beginning, they use your language. Eventually, it can go to what we call a spiritual language. We call it. If we translate it from Hebrew, it's wind, but it's not the right word. It's, um, can you explain it maybe? I, I don't know how to explain the word wind because the translation is wind, but it's not wind. But there is a language that you could use among souls. Yeah, the language that you're talking about, correct me if I'm wrong, is Fataruach. Yes. Fataruach is a Hebrew word, which pretty much means... It's interesting, in Hebrew, the word ruach, like R-U-A-C-H, is, it means spirit, but it also means wind, which is interesting because if you cross-reference other ancient teachings and languages and all that, pay attention to everything having to do with the spirit and God has a breath in it. 
So wind is also spirit in Hebrew. Just are they spelt differently? No. Spelt the same. Yeah. Long story short, Sfat Ruach is the spirit language, and that's how they communicate. Yes, but they can also communicate in your language in order to relay a message or to try to fix an issue that you might have, even down on planet Earth. And there are no emotions. There's only one emotion. Shame. There's no emotions. There's no love. There's no fear. There's no hate. There's nothing except shame. If you come back to the spirit world, and you are a bad person over here, the only thing you're going to feel is shame. And it's not something they put you on trial for. Again, you don't see human beings. You see lights. I can see a light, and I can say, this is Jason. This is David. And I can tell. Even though they almost look the same, there's like, for example, there are over a million variations of the color white. Only on the white color. And every light has... Okay, I identify him as Jason. So, and again, it's not that he has a sign on him, shame. It's just, you can tell out of his light, you can read his light and see shame. So you know, he went through something that he wasn't supposed to go through. This is your tukun. So when you come back, you do what you gotta do. Hopefully the next time, the sign of the shame will not be there. And it's a sign in your light. Yes, that you can read. You are a light when you are there. He is a light. And you can read each other. Is it almost like a fingerprint, but a light print? Yeah, make believe that you are totally naked, and everything is transparent. You can't hide anything. Total transparency. So everything you ever did, the soul knows. And every soul knows what every other soul knows. This is what I was talking to you about. Hopefully to reach within 170 years or sooner to get full transparency that the spirit life will be here within your body. Full transparency. Once there will be full transparency, nobody will do any evil to anybody else because there is full transparency. Everybody is going to know. So you don't need the jail system. You don't need the police. You don't need anything. You need transparency. And once you only work within transparency, as ETs are, there's no need for policing. You mentioned that souls who reincarnate to those different dimensions, other places, are able to impact the world on Earth, physically speaking. Can you give examples of what something like that would look like? Souls are the ones to determine or granting permission to other souls to come down. So that's one way of affecting it. Every soul that comes in, it affects the universe, whether you like it or not. So that's one thing. Let me just go back. Before I said there's no emotions at all. The emotion love, for example. You could see it on the light, but there's no sense of love over there. But once it comes down, love is the first emotion that comes in. There's only two emotions in human beings. Love and fear. Everything else is a byproduct. There's no other emotions in our, in our entities. Me, you, everybody else. Two only. Remember, love and fear. So for example, if somebody hates someone, the emotion hate comes from fear. You hate him because you fear something for them. That's why you hate him. You understand? Mm -hmm. And if you want to cuddle with someone, the emotion that you feel is because you love him. Everything is based on love and fear, and everything else is light through energy that travels. I hope I made myself clear. So back to how souls impact this place. Are there, just like there's TLS physically doing certain things here, are there souls in higher places working behind the scenes with their task, role, or job being to fix something here on Earth? Yes, but the example I gave you just before could be another example where a soul will communicate with another entity on Earth through a dream in order to relay a message to his daughter, to his son. It happens. They can do that. Not all of them can do it, but many souls can do that. So that's another way of affecting it. Those entities I call light, and there are billions of variations of light. For example, 
We have the color of the rainbow in our world. That we know this is the colors that exist. Over there, there is much more than just the colors of the rainbow. It's like a huge amount of colors. I don't know what to name them even. You never saw these colors before unless you were going to travel into space. You could see them. Once you reach those lights I'm talking about, you could physically see them once you pass through space, one trillion light years away. Then you see different lights, at the mark of the trillion mark. Don't ask me why, I don't know. But that's the way it goes. Only then you can experience physical lights. But those lights, if you go into the spirit world tomorrow morning, you're going to see those lights that I'm talking about. Imagine those lights. Entities. They could use such as a prayer in order to help certain people or certain conditions, not only on planet Earth, but all over the universe. Again, I use the word prayer because it's the only way we can comprehend what they're doing. Again, why would they pray? Again, to reach the source. Tenth dimension. You understand how it works? So at the end of the day, it's all one light. One dimension. One frequency, once you reach the light. And it's infinite. And it's infinite. Same thing. The universe. There is no beginning and there is no end. When the creator created the universe, he never created it. It was always here. There's no single moment in time that you could say, Today God created so and so. Creation is an ongoing process, non-stop process. This is going on throughout the entire universe. It was always here and will always be here. Could you lose a planet here and there? Yes. But the universe will always be here. Understood. Even if they'll throw atomic bombs and EMPs and whatever you want. At the end of the day, the source is the power. The ultimate power. And ultimate control. And the decision, the ultimate decisions of how things are being run is done through the 10th dimension. And the 10th dimension only. Everything else is a byproduct. You've mentioned many times that we're all one. We're all connected. God is one. There's one source. If there's one source, but we experience this duality between good and evil, or God and the devil, a lot of people talk about Satan and the devil, does the devil really exist if all is one and God is the only source? The fact that you as a human made something up doesn't make it part of the purity of God. You chose as a soul to do something that we humans call evil doesn't mean God is responsible, unless you want to say God is responsible for everything because he made you. No. God made you, but gave you free will. Free choice. If you chose to murder somebody, it's your choice. You can't blame God for it. Same thing with the invention of evil, Satan. The invention of religion. It's an invention. Religion was made up in order to control the masses. I want to shift to God religion, the Bibles, it's probably the most important thing right now. It's also going to be the last segment of this interview, but I want to leave it on this for, for a very important reason, because there's a big confusion between religion and spirituality. There's a confusion when it comes to interpretation of the Bible or the Bibles, multiple, Old Testament, New Testament, Quran, whatever it is. And you actually say something very interesting. You say on one hand, you're anti-religion. On the other hand, you validate the power of the Bibles by saying that they possess certain very powerful codes that have the ability to help us reach a very high level of awareness if we know how to use them. So the first question is, if on one side you're anti-religion, on the other side, you are validating the Bibles, What's the difference between the two? The Bible was given to us as a book of laws. A book of a lifestyle that you have to live in order to pursue a better life for ourselves. I know there are codes in there that I don't understand, and I cannot read the codes, and there's a lot of good information in there. And if you're going to live according to the lifestyle of the Ten Commandments, for example, you're going to be a better human being. I'm not knocking it down. But then religious leaders came and decided to take over. They gave the interpretation to the Bible. They changed the rules, and they're still today making changes to the rules. 
and laws of the Bible in order to fit the needs of themselves, usually, or whatever it is. But it's all made by the religious leaders, usually corrupt leaders, in all religions. I'm not just talking Judaism. Every religion is the same thing. Now through the religion, they control the people. That's how they get donations in. Most of them are multimillionaires and making money. That's how they survive. Every rabbi, okay? How does he survive? On donations. You're going to stop the donations tomorrow. He'll starve to death. He cannot work anywhere. He doesn't know how to do any other labor except being a rabbi. And by the way, think about it for a second. A rabbi. When does he do his work? On Saturday. On the holidays. And according to the Torah, you're not supposed to work on a Saturday or on the holidays. He gets paid for his job. He gets a salary. A priest is the same way. They get paid for their job. It's supposed to be a spiritual job. But it's a religious job. It was made up, and it goes like this for a generation. And that's how the Vatican controls their people. Do you think that the problem is the Bible, or the problem is the people reading the Bible? The problem is religious leaders, and we as common people don't know what the hell we are reading, and we are being misled. How do we fix that? That's a good question. Number one, abolish all religions. It will happen, and I know it will happen. That's, again, the date we're talking about. When you say abolish religion, are you saying get rid of the Bible, or are you saying abolish religion? Abolish religion, again. It was made up by people to control the people. Very simple. And they are doing a very good job at it. Look at the Vatican. And the power that the Vatican has. It's the most corrupt organization. That brings me to my last question here. A lot of people speak about this idea of the Antichrist. Somebody that's going to come up, rise up, looking like they have really good intentions, that are actually here to do terrible stuff, which makes sense. I think we're seeing a lot of that today in terms of individuals up there, of what they're doing. Maybe they're not quite the Antichrist, but they're definitely in the trajectory and the direction. My question for you is, as we approach these new times of, of individuals rising up and leaders rising up and changes being made, how do the people, how do the viewers that are watching this and the rest of the world know how to distinguish between who's the Antichrist and who's actually doing something to change the world for the better? It's a good question. To give it in a short answer, when the real leader will show up, we will know. How will we know? Because he's going to show us things to prove that he is the real guy. Again. That's what everyone calls the Messiah. Today, unfortunately, every leader is the Antichrist, almost. The corruption is like... You cannot even comprehend. How is it possible that the United States is giving the Jews and the Arabs at the same time money and ammunition and planes? If they want to make peace, the President of the United States, any President, can make peace tomorrow. You know how? Stop the money. Stop the ammunition. They will stop fighting. They will be busy surviving. Very simple. But now again, they made up a religion called Islam. And they made up a religion called Judaism. And this guy says, my God is better than your God, and your God is fake and mine. And it's the same story for thousands of years and people are being butchered for no reason. If you want peace, you can make peace. Whoever's running the show behind the scenes, those families we always spoke about, they can make peace tomorrow. They don't want to because war makes money. Big picture to, to bring this to a close. Is there any message you want to share? This is going to be the end of part four. We started this a few months ago. My intention was always to have a series like this. You were much more close in the beginning. You're much more open now, I think, from the feedback that you're seeing, which is awesome. Is there any closing message that you'd want to give to everybody watching right now with everything that you've set up until this point? I think I've said it before. I'm going to say it again. Stop listening to the media. You're being brainwashed. Go out to the streets and demonstrate. 
Sound your voice. Don't keep quiet. Protect your children. Protect your family. Protect your neighbors. All of you, as one. There's a lot of information out there through the internet that they cannot control. The fact that they censor people like you and many others in the field just show you. What are you afraid of? Why are you censoring? I thought it's a free country. I thought it's a democracy. A man has the right to speak his mind. Why do they shut you down? You've been shut down many times. They shut you down all over. You're 24 years old. You're not that famous. Why they shut you down? What are they afraid of? They have a reason to be afraid. The reason is the people. You are getting to the people. And that's what they're afraid of. But if you're going to continue, and people will rise up all over the world, not only here, but all over the world, and demand their freedom, because we have no freedom. We're all slaves right now. This thing has to stop. Immediately. I hope it does. I hope so too. Sooner than later. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope to see you here again at some point. Thank you.